John Constable is one of two giants of early 19th century British landscape painting. Joseph Mallard William Turner, of course, being the other. Kenwood House is fortunate to have works by both artists, these being the coast scene of fishermen hauling a boat ashore by Turner, painted in around 1803, and the rather smaller oil sketch, Branch Hill Pond, by John Constable, painted in 1821. But this talk is going to focus on Constable, who was less celebrated during his lifetime. John Constable was born in 1776 in Suffolk and was the son of a well-heeled mill owner on the Essex-Suffolk border, an area he loved and depicted in many of his compositions. This drawing in pencil and chalk is a self-portrait that Constable did in around 1799 and was probably produced with the aid of a mirror due to the fact that if you look carefully you can see that his jacket is buttoned the wrong way round, making it a mirror image. He was clearly uh, an accomplished portrait artist, but we know from his correspondence that portraiture didn't interest him. His real passion from the outset lay in portraying the landscape. This is his father's mill at Flatford Mill today, which is very well preserved and owned by the National Trust. If you haven't already visited, I'd certainly recommend a trip there. And this is a reproduction of the oil sketch that hangs in the breakfast room at Kenwood House. It isn't one of Lord Ivers um, that he, uh, it was actually acquired more recently, I think in 2004, um, for the internet's career. Um, it was painted in 1821 when Constable was living in Hampstead at number 40 Well Walk, near Kenwood House, with his wife and children. And uh, this, in fact, is the house in Well Walk, which is now privately owned. His wife, Maria, suffered from TB, so they deliberately uh, chose to live in Hampstead, as it was high above the smogs of the city, for which London had become well known at that time. The oil sketch is one of many so-called plain air oil sketches made by Constable during his lifetime. Plain air, I should say here, is a, is a French term meaning, simply meaning um, painting out of doors. And Constable is by no means the first artist to sketch directly from uh, outdoors. Uh, there were other artists before him. Uh, Agostino Tassi and Claude Lorraine, for example, were both uh, advocates for painting in the open air. Constable was encouraged to go outdoors and paint from the nature by the artist Benjamin West, who was president of the Royal Academy at the time that Constable was studying there. West was a noted American artist who had visited England and ended up carving a successful career here as a painter of large scale history and religious subjects and had become known at the height of his success as the American Raphael. And this is a self-portrait of West that he painted in around 1763. So thanks to West, Constable um, started to paint outdoors and would continue to do so throughout his lifetime. Now, though Constable is clearly uh, not the first to uh, sketch outdoors, I think we can safely say here that um, he took the practice to new heights. He made hundreds of these oil sketches, working um, very rapidly from nature, out of doors. And these sketches would have been used in preparation for finished exhibition paintings completed in the studio. Uh, they would certainly not have been framed. Um, and the frame that it hangs in at Kenwood um, would undoubtedly have been added in the late 19th century by an art dealer. This oil sketch, like so many others, uh, is actually painted on paper. Um, and to produce uh, this piece, Constable would have glued several sheets of paper together and primed the paper with a colored background. Uh, in this instance, he would always start by, uh, doing this by either using a pink or blue as the, as the ground color. And in this sketch, um, you can see, see here, this area here is 
where the pink shows through um, and revealing the sky. And, the, um, and it was a technique he used a lot to uh, give the painting some sort of depth and uh, he, it would create the, the sense of light. It was painted um, on the day of George IV's coronation on the 19th of July, 1821. And it shows figures uh, swimming, you can see here in, in the pond. Uh, the pond actually no longer exists, but there is talk of reinstating it. Uh, this particular subject is one that Constable painted several times, um, both as oil sketches and as finished studio pieces. So I'll just show you a selection that I found of uh, Branchill Pond. Uh, this finished piece uh, is from another viewpoint uh, and depicts wonderful rain, rain clouds and now hangs at the Cleveland Museum of Art in the United States, I believe. Uh, this study of Branch Hill Pond was exhibited by Constable in 1825 and according to the inscription on the back, was left unfinished deliberately. And we know this um, from his friend, William Purton, who um, inherited um, the painting from Constable. Um, and Constable was so satisfied with the rendering of the sky that he didn't want to finish the painting for fear of spoiling it. This finished oil painting from 1825 with a boy sitting on the steep bank on the right was given to Constable's good friend and neighbor in Well Walk, Jack Bannister, who was a comic actor and a great admirer of Constable's work. Um, Constable writes to a friend at the time saying, I have just had a visit from Mr. Bannister to request a landscape. He has long desired one of me in which he says he can feel the wind blowing in his, in his face. He says my landscape has something in it beyond freshness. And this final example is another oil sketch uh, completed outdoors at Branch Hill Pond from a different vantage point. And again, you can see um, the, the, the pink ground showing through here uh, with the dramatic um, bold shafts of sunlight. The oil sketch hanging at Kenwood House doesn't seem to relate directly to any of these uh, finished studio pieces of which we've just seen a handful. Um, Constable used these oil sketches in the way um, that artists today might use photography as a point of reference, recording the play of light, the weather conditions, the clouds, and so on. But of course, this is 1821. It would be another 20 years before photography would become commercially available. I have compiled a selection of other oil sketches that he made throughout his life uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of finish which obviously varied in accordance with the weather conditions he found himself working under. This oil sketch is of Brighton Beach where he lived with his family for four years between 1824 and 1828. He felt that the sea would be beneficial for his wife's, wife's health, uh, hence the four years here. This oil sketch of Salisbury Cathedral relates directly to the well-known finished studio piece entitled Salisbury Cathedral from the Meadows, which is famous for its rainbow. Unfortunately, this uh, reproduction is again, not very good. Um, it was painted in 1831, um, following the death of his wife. And many have interpreted the painting as a symbol of hope with its metaphorical ray of sunlight beyond the storm clouds. And while it's feasible that this might have been Constable's intention, there's no documentary uh, evidence to uh, corrobor corroborate this. This is a rather lovely uh, sketch, or a sketch of Dedham Lock and Mill from 1816, and again relates to the rather well-known Finnish studio piece, which is this. <clears throat> And the final example I'll show you um, will look rather familiar. This is, of course, one of many of the oil sketches he produced um, for the, the Haywain. 
And interestingly, uh, the next slide shows you a full-size six-foot oil sketch before he uh, started working on the Hayway. And then finally, of course, we get to see the finished piece. The Hayway, of course, is Constable's best-known masterpiece. It's one of the most reproduced images in Western art and has become ubiquitous. It's been reproduced on tea towels, mugs, jigsaws, posters, you name it. Um, and to some extent, I suppose it has devalued Constable's place as one of the UK's most important landscape artists. So, so why is John Constable such an important figure in the development of landscape painting? Well, he may not have been the, most, uh, the first uh, to paint outdoors, but he was certainly the first to practice this, uh, to, to, bring, to take it to another level. Um, and thanks to his love for and fascination with science, he was the first to treat landscape painting in a, in a scientific fashion. Unlike others before him, he recorded weather conditions fastidiously and was intent on reproducing these, these conditions in his compositions. And his scientific approach and his fascination with science is also very clearly illustrated by his very close friendship with the English scientist, Michael Faraday. And I think it's important here to uh, understand that his intention was to be true to nature and not to romanticize it in any way, shape or form. As far as we know, John Constable is the first artist in the history of Western art to, scientific, to scientifically categorize the clouds he painted. In fact, he produced countless studies of skies and he would often annotate these pieces, including details about the weather. He is known to have owned several meteorological texts and could identify different types of cloud. There is a cloud study in the VNA, annotated cirrus clouds, for instance. And uh, in fact, I remember going to a major retrospective of uh, his work as a child many years ago at the Tate. And I do remember stepping into one room that was filled with countless studies of clouds in both oil, watercolor and pencil, literally hundreds of the things. So I thought I'd just um, put together a very small example of his cloud studies. <clears throat> In terms of his style and technique, uh, John Constable was very much his own man. He didn't want to paint like artists before him and would employ techniques that allowed him to best emulate the natural world. So, so when he painted foliage, for instance, um, and there's a close up of the hayway, not the best of uh, shots, um, he would load his brush with lots of paint and physically attack the canvas. And as a result, the surface of the painting would often be very, very rough. Um, and it's important to say here that this was seen by many who represented the art establishment um, at the time as being rather undesirable as the fashion at that time was for landscape painters to keep the surface of their compositions reasonably smooth and this, this smoothness was uh, often referred to as finish so inevitably uh, constable's paintings would come under fire for their lack of finish uh, to which constable famously replied on one occasion well there isn't much finish in nature is there Throughout his life, Constable was intensely interested in the quality of light, the way scudding clouds cast shadows over fields, the haze after a downpour, late after afternoon sun on a riverbank, and so on. He proudly wrote of his delight in decay and neglect. Old rotten banks, slimy posts, and brickwork. I love such things, he writes. Today, of course, John Constable is often cited as a painter of chocolate box scenes, and to some extent, he has become a victim of his own success, since many of his finished studio paintings have become 
so well known to us, and they have become hackneyed. But we also have to remember that these paintings, many of which are six-footers, are naturalistic and based on meticulous observation and countless studies from life. And it's also important, I think, to say here that they are also a homage to his vision of an ideal world, the world of his childhood, a very happy childhood by all accounts. Now, this painting of the cornfield was a country lane called Fen Lane that Constable knew very well indeed. Uh, as says a child, this is the lane down which he walked to school from East Burgholt to Dedham. And the boy in the painting could almost be Constable himself looking for tadpoles. His was a childhood that was not only blissfully happy, but it was a childhood free from the threats of pollution and the onset of the Industrial Revolution. So I think it's fair to say that his paintings are imbued with a hefty helping of nostalgia. So, how was Constable's work viewed during his lifetime? Sadly, he was largely overlooked by the English artistic fraternity of the day, and critics like John Ruskin had little time for him and dismissed him as a painter of subjects of low order. Ruskin went as far as accusing him of banality. Of course, it was Turner who gained the greater recognition during his lifetime, Indeed, Turner became a member of the Royal Academy at the tender age of 15, whereas Constable wouldn't gain acceptance until he was 40. <clears throat> so was there anyone out there who liked poor old Constable? Well, yes, thankfully there was. The French, bless their cotton socks, couldn't get enough of him. Theodore Jericho was so taken with a hay rain in London that Constable was invited to exhibit it at the Paris Salon the following year, where he received the gold medal, no less. And the vast majority of paintings that he sold throughout his lifetime were in fact sold to French collectors. There can be little doubt that Constable's work directly influenced Delacroix and the Barbizon School, including Jean-Francois Millet, and here we see the iconic gleaners by Millet, and Theodore Rousseau, and they, of course, in turn influenced the early Impressionists, including Monet and Pissarro, who, of course, worked outdoors too. So Constable's place in art history really, really is seminal. How should we see his work today? Well, I think we need to put ourselves in his shoes. If climate change and global warming not to mention COVID-19, are the biggest threats to the environment and our health today. In John, Con Con John Constable's time, the biggest threat from his standpoint came, of course, from the Industrial Revolution. <clears throat> and his way of protesting against the horrors of the Industrial Age was to, be, to depict a better, purer world through his art. While Turner depicted the age of steam, Constable chose to ignore industry altogether. He didn't like it. He didn't like the pollution, the poverty, and the erosion of country ways. And let's not forget also that the industrial smog threatened the health of his own wife, who sadly succumbed to TB at the tender age of 40. So his love of the countryside and the rural way of life cannot really be overstated here. His paintings are a celebration of this pure and healthy lifestyle, a lifestyle that he felt was being eroded by the industrial age in which he was living. And it's this passion for depicting the natural world that can be seen as a kind of personal crusade to preserve the environment of his childhood. He was in a way, a kind of David Attenborough of his day, opening his audience's eyes to the wonders of the natural world. So let's not view him as a painter of chocolate box scenes, but see him in the context of his time. He was certainly a very radical artist who cared passionately about the countryside of his childhood and who, in his own quiet way, changed the way artists viewed and painted the landscape. A landscape, by the way, that can still be viewed to this day. Thank you.